based on your experience, for somebody who um, you know is considering making the plunge but isn't quite there yet, what are the first one or two things that they should think about or do you know on that path to becoming a, a science communicator? Yeah, it's, it's, it's understandable to be a bit anxious about it and not want to do it, and it's not for everybody as well. Remember, I think because some just don't want to be in the limelight, mm -hmm. and often scientists prefer being in a lab doing their experiments or whatever. So yeah, it's understandable yeah. if, if you're a bit uneasy about it. But my advice is go for it for definite because mm. it's so rewarding and that's been my experience you know it's fantastically rewarding because if you can explain something complicated to someone else and they begin to understand it and they begin to think about it and you can see their faces light up in my experience as well by the way it's a wonderfully thrilling thing it's extremely rewarding it is a bit like being a teacher let's face it and teachers are motivated for the same reason you know mm. so, so I always if you're a bit reluctant give it a go now certainly you can give it a go once or twice or three times if you definitely don't like it then that's okay to back out of it it can be written it doesn't have to be in person either mm. face to face can, can unnerve people too you know but anytime you try to explain something complicated in a way that people people understand, it's intellectually rewarding for yeah. you, yeah. and then they are benefiting from it. And, and one reason we do science ultimately is hopefully to help our fellow human beings anyway. You know, and this is another way to help them, especially if it's a serious topic and they're frightened, and they're anxious, and they're uh, you know uneasy. Then it's really beneficial because you are explaining something to them and then reassuring them. You know, yeah. and in the health area like I do, I'll explain the latest breakthrough, say in Alzheimer's, that gives patients huge comfort because they now have hope there mm. may be a therapy for them or yeah. their families, you know. Yeah. And I think one, one thing science communication brings to people is hope, actually. That's the word I would use. Yeah. Because there is fear, there's uncertainty. The world is changing so fast, it's yeah. so complicated. Yeah. With AI coming down the track, with climate change. If you can give people a bit of hope through mm. communicating your science, that's a great thing. And then the other thing I'd say is this, if you've made a discovery, you should shout that from the rooftops. <laughs> Because it's your discovery, you know, yeah. and you should say, I've made the, not, not in a pompous, aggressive way, the way. Yeah. you want to share the discovery, because you've, you've, you've spent years working on this damn thing. I guess the initial satisfaction as a scientist is when you get something published. It's like that writ large in a way, you know, and that's very satisfying to publish a paper, because mm. you know, now people see it. Yeah, yeah. Why are you publishing your paper? You're publishing to tell the world what you've found and to move the field along. Why do you communicate this stuff? It's to tell the world what you've discovered. And that can be very rewarding. And, and, and then again, as I said earlier, it can feed back to you in so many ways and help your research anyway. So yeah. th those are all the reasons. So I just, you know, just go for it is my advice. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just give it a go. And you will find, I'd say nine times out of 10, if you give it a go, even though you're nervous, you'll find it tremendously rewarding watching mm. is, is, is what I'd say yeah. overall. In your experience, how do you go about building trust uh, in your audience, you know, trust in science, trust uh, in, in you as a, a kind of ambassador for, for science? And Tony Fauci, who's a very famous immunologist, we all probably know his name yeah. because of COVID. And I've met Tony a couple of times. I read something he was writing at the time of the COVID thing because he, he was all over the media. Yeah. He said that, he said, right? He said that there's three things you've got to be able to do when you're communicating science mm. to build that kind of trust. He said, first of all, if you don't know the answer, say you don't know. Because mm. if you waffle off, Try to, and of course, the first time you're in the media, you're anxious that they're only asking you on because you're an expert. So if you can't display your expertise, you feel you're letting them down. You know? yeah. So you're inclined to sort of either dodge the question or, or maybe get it wrong. It's all going to say, you know, I don't know the answer and I'm going to look it up. I'll come back to you if I can find yeah. out. Is that thing? Yeah. The second thing is to be as clear as possible in your mind. Clarity is the key. Don't use too much jargon. You know? mm. If you use too much jargon, that can be a breach of trust as well. Because you're coming across as the real expert and you're kind of looking down on the audience mm. then. You know? mm. And never look down. Never think that that person hasn't got the capacity to understand complex things. Treat them absolutely as an equal mm. in, the, in this dialogue as well. Because if, if you're the other way, that, that might make them suspicious of you or whatever it is. You know? yeah. So I think, yeah. I think that's the, cl the clarity is extremely important as well. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing is, remember, it's not about you. Now, that might sound a bit strange. We're not talking about, you know, Love Island here. <laughs> now, the reason why that's important is if you come across as it's about you, then they might not trust you. Right. They might think, oh, this person's showing off or trying mm. to get something out of this you know yeah. so try to remember it's not about you it has to be about you to an extent and your personality will, will come through you know but it's not really about you yeah. now, now on a broader level then you've got to tell people as well science is the best thing we have to understand the world by far and then of course the other big thing about the, the trust question is as well the scientific method is everything but i do think you can learn it and you can you can learn how to do it so i think there'll be a premium on on learning this skill as to how to excite, inform, you know, 
and reassure maybe and all those sorts of things you know and I really should start with them um, think, think about this I suppose. again go back to the question why are you a scientist why did you become a scientist at the age of five six ten fifteen mm. twenty twenty one whenever the bug bit and you became a scientist yeah why was that it was because of your excitement your curiosity your, your sense of wonder about the world and then and then you began to do science yourself mm. then you began to make these discoveries yourself infuse it with that always you know and then you might you might be able to get the message across is the way to think of it. I think as well the other thing is it, it may become more like storytelling, strangely. Because that given there's so much noise out there and there's yeah. so much confusion, the best way to get someone interested is to tell them a story, remember. So the narrative mm. bit might become more important. Mm. And that's a good thing, because it'll make it more relatable then to the mm. people that you're talking to, remember. So I think those, those, some of those changes might become relevant. Mm. As the way we do things becomes more and more digital, shall we say, and more and more say computerized in the broader sense with AI yeah. and all those sorts of things, the human element has to become more and more important I think in the future to yeah. make it more engaging. So maybe that's, yeah. that's where we're headed. You know?